Welcome to Typology and Prophecy. My name is Kyle. Today we're going to be talking about the typological connection between ancient Egypt and the King of the South found in the later part of Daniel chapter 11. Now while I do my best to make each video as standalone as possible, since Daniel chapter 11 is a pretty big subject to cover, I've been breaking it up into shorter videos, which means some of the context for this video has already been laid out in prior episodes. For example, in episode 2, I showed that there is a typological connection between the King of the South and the Sons of Ham, and in my previous video I covered the typology of two of those Sons of Ham, Cush and Canaan. So that brings us to the topic of today's video, which is identifying the typological value of Egypt. Now to start with, I want to point out that Egypt is referred to by name three times in Daniel chapter 11, all of which are mentioned in conjunction with being the king of the south. The first is in verse 8, which reads, And he shall carry their gods captive to Egypt. This is a reference specifically to the exploits of Ptolemy III, and more generally speaking, to the Ptolemaic Empire, which was of course located in Egypt. Now something important to note here that really helps argue in favor of applying the typological method to Daniel 11 is that when the angel was revealing to Daniel the future events related to the division of Alexander the Great's kingdom, he uses language that would have been familiar to Daniel, or for that matter to anyone living in Judea or Jerusalem during the period of Babylonian captivity. It would have been common knowledge at the time that the term the king of the north would have been a reference to Babylon and the term the king of the south would have been a reference to Egypt. These were the two superpowers of the day and Babylon was of course to their north and Egypt was of course to their south. For example, when Jeremiah warns of judgment coming from Babylon, which he often did, he refers to it as judgment coming from the north. So centuries before Alexander the Great even lived, the angel revealed to Daniel that the division of his kingdom after his death would take on the typological value of the two most dominant kingdoms that existed in Daniel's day. In other words, the Seleucid Empire would take on the typological value of Babylon, while the Ptolemaic Empire would take on the typological value of Egypt. Now, this, of course, applies to the terms the king of the north and the king of the south at the beginning of the chapter, which refer to the division of Alexander the Great's kingdom. But when we get to the king of the south at the later part of Daniel chapter 11, specifically verse 40, which begins with the phrase, at the time of the end, we're clearly no longer talking about the ancient kingdom of Greece, but rather a power that will exist at the end times that, just like the Ptolemaic Empire did, will take on the typological value of ancient Egypt. Now, when it comes to drawing typology from ancient Egypt and applying it to powers that be today, let me illustrate something. When we think about the pyramids which are to Egypt, what, say, the Eiffel Tower is to Paris or the Colosseum is to Rome, the base of the pyramid is very wide, but the top concentrates into a single point. Likewise, when it comes to the typology of Egypt, there is a wide or a broad number of topics we could discuss. However, in this video, I want to focus on what I believe is the apex of the pyramid, meaning Egypt's highest and most relevant typological value. So in verse 40 we read, At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. Now drop down to verse 42, it states, He, referring to the king of the north, shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. So in verse 40, the king of the south attacks, which triggers a counterattack, and in verse 42, Egypt is identified as a specific target of the king of the north's whirlwind counterattack. 
So what does this mean? Well, simply put, it means that Egypt is the king of the south. Now, of course, you can interpret this literally, or you can, as I do, interpret this as a symbolic or typological reference to Egypt. Now, besides the point I already made in defense of applying typology to Daniel 11, another reason that I take the symbolic or typological route is because this is the route that the Apostle John took in the book of Revelation when he spoke about Egypt. Speaking of the beast in Revelation chapter 11, that ascends out of the abyss or the bottomless pit, depending on your translation, John used the following language. He wrote, And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called. Now, before we read on, this phrase, which spiritually is called, that John uses here, means that what comes next is not to be taken literally. The phrase which spiritually is called means that what John is going to reference next is a typological, not a literal reference. So what is this typological reference that John makes? He says, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So John typologically refers to the beast from the abyss as the sons of Ham which is exactly what I've pointed out in this series, is how Daniel 11 identifies the king of the south. Both the king of the south and the beast from the abyss are likened, typologically speaking, to the sons of Ham. Now before we get into our main story, which will unfold the top of the pyramid, the apex typological identity of the king of the south, I want to highlight the third reference to Egypt found in Daniel chapter 11 and show how it parallels a historical text found in the book of Ezekiel. Now let's start first with the text in Ezekiel. In chapter 29, starting verse 17, we read, And it came to pass in the 27th year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to labor strenuously against Tyra. Every head was made bald and every shoulder rubbed raw. Yet neither he nor his army received wages from Tyra for the labor which they expended on it. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Surely I will give the land of Egypt to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He shall take away her wealth, carry off her spoil, and remove her pillage and that will be wages for his army. I have given him the land of Egypt for his labor because they work for me, says the Lord God. Now after the destruction of Jerusalem, Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to Tyre. And this is the events that Ezekiel is describing here. This siege lasted for 13 years, but ended without the decisive victory that was sought which also means it ended without obtaining the riches and spoils that was common to war. Now, because Nebuchadnezzar worked for him, God decided to remedy this lack of compensation, if you will, by giving over to Babylon the wealth of Egypt. Now, as I pointed out earlier, the use of the terms the king of the south and the king of the north is intended to draw our attention back to this time period during the lives of Daniel, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, who all lived through the period known as the Babylonian captivity. The historical conflicts and the battles between Babylon and Egypt that took place during these prophets' lives, these events are the typological reference points for end-time references to Babylon and Egypt that are found in both Daniel and Revelation. Now, I believe this historic transfer of wealth from Egypt to Babylon that we read about in Ezekiel is significant for two reasons. The first is that it begins to shed light on the typological value of Egypt, which is, in the historical context, was its wealth. The second is that it gives us the story based in history This serves to illustrate the meaning of the following end-time prophecy. Starting in verse 42 of Daniel 11, he, reference to the king of the north, shall stretch out his hand against the countries and the land of Egypt, 
shall not escape, verse 43, he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. So when the king of the north responds to being attacked, it specifically identifies Egypt as the target of his counterattack, and it specifically states that the king of the north will take from Egypt the source of its power, which just like in Ezekiel's day, will be its wealth, i.e. its treasures of gold and silver and all its precious things. In other words, the source of Egypt's power at the time of the end will be money, or even more specifically, its control over the monetary system. Keep in mind that that's what gold and silver was in Daniel's day. It was currency, or plainly put, it was money. Now, in order for this end-time transfer of wealth to take place, it means that the monetary system of the world, i.e. the world's reserve currency, at the time of the end, must first be in control of our end-time typological Egypt, which means if, and I believe we are, living in the last days, that would mean that the typological value of ancient Egypt would need to translate to today's most powerful central bank, which is none other than the Federal Reserve. Now the question is, do we find in the Bible the historical basis for this claim that Egypt's typological value translates to today's most powerful central bank? I believe the answer to that is yes, we do, and I intend to show just that in the following story found in Genesis chapter 47. Now, when we think about ancient Egypt, the most prominent imagery that comes to mind is slavery. This is primarily because of the story of the Exodus when God sent Moses to demand that Pharaoh let the Hebrew slaves free. Of course, Pharaoh unwisely refused, and in response, God sent plagues on Egypt to persuade Pharaoh to reconsider. Now, in the shadows cast by this grand story of the Exodus, what is often overlooked is the fact that long before the Hebrews were enslaved, the Egyptian people themselves became slaves. And ironically, the architect of this enslavement of the Egyptian people was none other than Joseph. Now, in my book, Novus Ordo Romanos, yes, time for a shameless book plug here, link in the description below, I have a chapter titled, Pharaoh's America, Who Owns the Dream? In my book, I identify from Genesis chapter 47 what I refer to as the seven steps to slavery. These are the seven steps that Joseph used to orchestrate the total enslavement of the Egyptian people. Now, what we're going to find is that these exact seven steps, or principles, if you will, provided a blueprint for our in-time typological Egypt has orchestrated its own rise to power over the last hundred plus years. Now, before we get into the story, let me first identify the seven steps to slavery that we find present in the story of Genesis chapter 47. Step number one, create or utilize an economic crisis. Step number two, create a centralized control and ownership of the monetary system. In other words, create a central bank. Step three, create centralized ownership of all assets and means of production. Step four, create centralized ownership of all land. Step five, establish ownership of the people themselves, in other words, own their labor. Step six, put the people to work. And lastly, step seven, impose an income tax on their labor. All right, so let's get into the story. We'll start in verse 11. And Joseph situated his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. Then Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's household with bread according to their numbers in their families. So I start with this verse just to show that the forthcoming enslavement that we will see happening in the story is happening to the Egyptian people, not to the Hebrews. Yes, they will eventually become slaves themselves, but it doesn't take place during this story. Now in verse 13, 
Now there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. So in verse 13 we read that there was no bread in all the land, yet in verses 11 and 12 we just read that Joseph provided all his father, father's house with bread sufficient for their numbers. So we need to remember this. In times of famine, i.e. food shortages, it's not the elites or the ruling class that will go without. There will always be enough for their needs, but not so much when it comes to the needs of the people. Now in this story, we can clearly see that the economic crisis that precipitates the enslavement of the Egyptian people is specifically the lack of food, which raises an important question. From where does our bread come from? Now we know from the curse that God intended for man to work for his food, as it is written, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. But what about in times of famine when our own labor is not sufficient to provide for our own needs? In times of economic crisis, does our help come from Egypt? Or does it come from God? There's a reason why Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights before he faced temptation from the devil. And there's a reason why the first temptation was to turn the stones into bread. It was to emphasize the importance of the words Jesus spoke in response to the temptation. It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. When it comes to the principles of seeking first the kingdom of heaven, there is no more fundamental question than this one. When we are hungry, to whom will we turn for our bread? The prophet Isaiah wrote, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help. The reason is, as we will see in this story, when you turn to Pharaoh for bread, you will become Pharaoh's slave. Jesus said, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. Later in the same chapter, Jesus identified himself as the bread of life. He said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. If we eat from Pharaoh's table, we will be Pharaoh's servants. And the bread that Pharaoh gives us will perish right along with our hopes of eternal life. Egypt can offer nothing more than a life of indentured servitude that ends when this life does. This is why it's so important to understand what the typological value of Egypt is, because we are today, and will increasingly be so, faced with the same choice of either entangling ourselves with typological Egypt, which is the apex of the king of the south system at the time of the end, or whether we would truly seek the kingdom of heaven first and trust in God to keep his promise to add all these other things to us. If our fear of hunger, whether real or perceived, causes us to turn from God to Pharaoh for help, I'm afraid we will be lost. Now, if you recall, Joseph came to power because he was able to interpret Pharaoh's dream. He revealed to Pharaoh that his dream predicted seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. In gratitude for his interpretive services, Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of administering the affairs of the kingdom during the years of plenty and in the years of famine. While it would not be fair to say that either Joseph or Pharaoh were responsible for creating the economic crisis, It would be more than accurate to say that they most certainly did take advantage of it, which brings us to step number two, which is to seize control of the monetary system. In verse 14 it says, And Joseph gathered up all the money, notice that it says all the money, that was found in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan, for the grain which they bought, and Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. Look, When you have private and centralized control of the entire money supply of a land, what you have in modern day terms is a central bank. The people were starving, so they spent every last dime they had to buy bread. 
This was the mechanism that was used to suck all the money out of circulation and into Pharaoh's control. To the Egyptian people, this was a complete collapse of the monetary system. However, to Pharaoh, this established him as the central bank of Egypt. So let's move on to step number three, create centralized ownership of all assets and means of production. Start in verse 15. So when the money fell in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in your presence? For the money has failed. Now before I continue, let me just say this. If you put your trust in money, it will fail you. Verse 16. Then Joseph said, Give your livestock, and I will give you bread for your livestock, if the money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the cattle of the herds, and for the donkeys. Thus he fed them with bread in exchange for all their livestock that year. Now keep in mind that in an agricultural society, livestock represents both assets and means of production. For example, an ox represents wealth as well as the means of plowing the field. Now given that the money had failed in the land of Egypt, Joseph says, no money to buy bread, no problem. Just give Pharaoh all your assets and means of production and I will give you bread for one year. So that is what they did. Now Pharaoh had private and centralized control of not only all the money in the land of Egypt, but now he owned all the assets and means of production as well. Of course, when you're on a roll, why stop there? Which brings us to steps 4 and 5. Verse 18. When that year had ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is gone. My Lord also has our herds of livestock. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our lands? Buy us and our lands for bread, and we and our land will be servants of Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land may not be desolate. Then Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for every man of the Egyptians sold his field, because of the famine was severe upon them. So the land became Pharaoh's, and as for the people, he moved them into the cities from one end of the borders of Egypt to the other end. So what's going on in this story is rather incredible, however, not incredible in a good way. After the year ended and their supply of bread was gone, They came again to Joseph, but this time their demeanor had changed. The year before, they had almost demanded bread from Joseph, saying, Give us bread, for why should we die in your presence? Their spirit now broken, they came humbly before Joseph, referring to him as my Lord. In the year before, it was Joseph who had demanded that they give up their livestock in exchange for bread. However, this year, it was they themselves who offered their land and their own bodies in exchange for bread. Now what a sad state of affairs. The man would sell himself into slavery for nothing more than bread. But this is the harsh reality and inevitable end for those who start down the pathway of trusting in Egypt for every necessity of life. So at this point in the story, we've covered five steps And Pharaoh now owns all the money, assets, means of production, land, and the people themselves. How much worse can he get? Well, let's take a look at steps 6 and 7. Starting verse 23, Then Joseph said to the people, Indeed I have bought you and your land this day for Pharaoh. Look, here is seed for you. You shall sow the land, and it shall come to pass in the harvest, that you shall give one-fifth to Pharaoh. That's 20% for Pharaoh. Four-fifths shall be your own as seed for the field and for you food for those of your household and as food for your little ones. So they said, You have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants, i.e. slaves. And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt to this day, that Pharaoh should have one-fifth. So during the famine, the Egyptian people gave up all their money, 
their assets, means of production, land, and finally, they sold themselves into perpetual servitude to the state. And what did they get in return for all that they gave up? They got bread, a job, and a 20% income tax. Now, I mentioned earlier that these seven steps to slavery that were implemented by Joseph, that they would serve as a blueprint for more recent attempts at the enslavement of man. One such individual, also a descendant of Abraham, that was inspired by these same principles was none other than Karl Marx. Now, I cannot say for certain that Marx actually read Genesis chapter 47 and was directly inspired by the story, but given the similarities between this story and the views he laid out in the Communist Manifesto, it would be hard, nearly impossible really, to argue that there was not at least a common source of inspiration between the two. So what you see there on your screen is a point in the Communist Manifesto where Karl Marx summarizes his views into 10 action points that are necessary to implement communism. What we're going to do is we're going to compare his action points to the seven steps of slavery we find in the story of Genesis chapter 47. In Egypt, the pathway to slavery began with the establishment of Pharaoh's control over the monetary system, or in other words, in modern-day language, the establishment of Pharaoh as the central bank of Egypt. This is action point number five for Marx. He called for the centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly. In Egypt, the next step was for Pharaoh to take control of all the assets and means of production. He accomplished this when the people sold their livestock to him for bread. This is action point number seven for Marx. He called for extension of factories and and instruments of production owned by the state. In other words, Marx envisioned that just like Pharaoh did in ancient times, the modern state would also own all the means of production. In Egypt, the next two steps were to own all the land and the people themselves. For Marx, this made the top of the list at number one as he had called for abolition of property in land and all application of rents of land to public purposes. In action point number three, he called for abolition of all rights of inheritance. After all, if you are a slave and you don't own anything to begin with, what right would you have to leave anything to your children? The answer would be none. In Egypt, the final steps that sealed the enslavement of the Egyptian people were to put them to work and impose a 20% income tax upon the fruit of their labors. In action point number eight, Marx called for the equal liability of all to work, but of course, let's not forget about those taxes. In action point number two, Marx called for a heavy progressive or graduated income tax. Look, it would be impossible to ignore or to rationalize away just how precisely similar Karl Marx's vision for communism was with the process by which slavery was imposed in Egypt. Now, apart from a direct reading and plagiarism of Genesis chapter 47, the only explanation for this is that both Joseph and Marx had a common source of inspiration. Now, speaking of a common source of inspiration, and before we jump to the incorrect conclusion that communism alone is the sole fulfillment of typological Egypt, we need to understand something. There is no difference between central bank-controlled capitalism and communism, for both come from the exact same ideological source. In other words, they are simply just different sides of the same coin. Now, before we continue, let me clarify something. When I say there's no difference between capitalism and communism, I'm not saying there's no difference between capitalism and central bank-controlled capitalism, for there certainly is. The first is simply when free people, in the context of a free market, use money to facilitate the exchange of goods and services. 
The second is when the central bank uses money to facilitate the control and enslavement of the people who think they're living in a free market. When I say there's no difference between capitalism and communism, please understand that I'm referring to central bank-controlled capital markets, not simply free markets in and of themselves. Now, throughout the 20th century, we were taught to believe that there was this battle between good and evil, between capitalism and communism, that America represented the good guys and the Russians and the Soviet Union represented the evil bad guys. And why was America the good guys? Because we represented free market capitalism. But the truth is, we didn't represent free market capitalism, at least not in the 20th century. Yes, America was founded as a constitutional republic that had a free market capitalist-based economic system. However, that America ended in 1913 when then-President Woodrow Wilson handed over control of America's currency and thus its economy to the privately owned central bank we call the Federal Reserve. And despite the name, there is nothing federal or a reserve about it. The reality is this. Communism, if you want to call it that, came to America before it came to Russia. We noted in the story of the enslavement of the Egyptian people that the story begins with Pharaoh becoming the central bank of Egypt and it ends with a 20% income tax being imposed on the people. We should not think that it is a coincidence that both the constitutional amendment granting Congress the power to impose an income tax and the Federal Reserve Act were both passed in the same year, 1913. For both are essential elements to what constitutes typological Egypt and how slavery is imposed on us today. But someone will protest, no doubt, what do you mean, I'm not a slave? Are you sure about that? Consider how the Bible defines slavery. In Proverbs 22.7 it reads, The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Now that word servant means slave. Do you have a mortgage? Do you have a car payment? Are you carrying any balances on your credit card? If you answered yes, then you are a slave to the bank who lent you the money. And for those who are financially disciplined enough to stay out of debt, you're still a slave through the fact that your labor is owned and taxed by the government. If we are trying to find the modern counterpart to the typology of Egypt that reveals to us who the king of the south is in the later part of Daniel 11, we have to be looking at systems that produce the same results, i.e. the seven steps to slavery, that we find in the story of Genesis chapter 47. And the reality is this, both central bank-controlled capitalism and communism result in centralized control of the money, centralized control of assets and means of production, centralized ownership of all land, and ownership of the people through taxation of their labor. The primary difference is how ownership and control of these things is obtained and how it is maintained. It wasn't until 1917 that the bloody Bolshevik Revolution took place that established the Soviet Union and imposed communism on the people of Russia. But again, our not-bloody-at-all revolution had already taken place four years prior, in 1913. It's important to note that in ancient Egypt there was no bloody revolution, There is no account of a single person being killed in the process of the enslaving of the Egyptian people. Rather, it was accomplished peacefully and, quite frankly, willingly on the part of the people being enslaved. And so it has been in America. We willingly and peacefully gave up our God-given liberty in order to chase the American dream, which, of course, is all paid for through the financing of the banks. And as long as we keep showing up every day at our jobs, we will be able to keep up making those monthly payments that allow us to keep living the dream. But the truth is, it's not a dream at all. Much more like a nightmare. And it's what the Bible defines as slavery. 
Look, the only difference between communism and central bank controlled capitalism that we have here in America is the method of their implementation and control. It's the classic contrast between the carrot and the stick. In Russia and Eastern Europe, they got the stick. In America and in the West, we got the carrot. But the reality is they both produce the same results. I'm sure by now everyone has heard the Great Reset slogan, you will own nothing and be happy. Now as concerning as all the talk is that's coming out of the World Economic Forum, we need to understand that we already live under the reality of this Great Reset slogan. Because most Americans purchase just about everything using debt. The bank already owns just about everything in America. Homes, cars, businesses, televisions, and those OMG I just have to have them shoes. And most of us seem very happy to keep it all going just as long as we can get our next dose of shopping therapy financed on demand. So in conclusion, let us take one more look at this passage in Daniel chapter 11, starting in verse 42. He, referring to the king of the north, shall stretch out his hand against the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. Now what we've learned in this series is that the king of the south system is comprised of the typological sons of Ham collectively. However, just like it was in ancient times, Egypt today is likewise the most prominent of the sons of Ham, which means the apex of the pyramid, if you will, is the one who controls the treasures of gold and silver and all the precious things of Egypt. Now, there is no power in our world today that could fulfill the typology of this more fully than the Federal Reserve can. The Federal Reserve is the most powerful central bank in the world for two reasons. One, it owns the world's reserve currency, and two, it has the United States military backing it. The world order that we have lived under since World War II is one founded on the strength of the U.S. dollar being the world's reserve currency. Now, according to the prophecy, at some point in the future, the control of this source of the King of the South's power will pass from the king of the south to the king of the north. However, as of today, it is still under control of typological Egypt. In fact, just look at the front and back of the dollar bill. On the front, it states clearly who the currency belongs to. Right on the top, it says Federal Reserve Note. Now notice that on the back side is the very symbol of Egypt itself. Think about it. The typological link between Egypt and the Federal Reserve is literally printed right there on the dollar. Now, of course, there is plenty more that can and needs to be said on the subject, but that will do it for today. Thank you so much for joining me. If you have watched until the end, you are super awesome. Please consider leaving me a comment. Let me know what you think. And if you want, please hit the like button, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Also, please consider purchasing a copy of my book, Novus Ordo Romanos. The link is in the description below. Thank you for watching and God bless.